Continue. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, would you turn to tab 8 in the binder that we gave you this morning? Yes. Uh, this is um, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2879, um, and it's titled The Marriage Movement, A Statement of Principles. Um, and you're familiar with this, are you not, sir? Yes, sir. And um, this was put out um, by the Institute for American Values, is that correct? It was put out by three organizations, one of which was the Institute for American Values. And did you review this before it was put out? Yes, sir. And did you agree with it? Well, if if I had, if it had been my own writing, I would have. It, the words would not have been the same. But I supported in, uh, I supported the overall thrust of the document and felt that it was a valuable contribution to the public discussion. Um. And w one of the things the document talks about is how uh, marriage uh, uh, is in crisis. Uh, is that correct? I, I don't recall if it used the words crisis, but it wouldn't surprise me that if to find that it, it did. Uh, if you turn to page 5, Your Honor, I would offer Plaintiff's Exhibit 2879. No objection, Your Honor. Very well, 2879 is admitted. Yes, okay, it does use the word crisis. Um, and it discusses why marriage has weakened, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, I mean, I'm assuming it does. I, I believe it. My recollection is that it does. Yes, and your recollection is correct. Um, uh, and the reasons that are given why marriage is weakened uh, have nothing to do with uh, homosexuality or same-sex marriage, correct? The reasons given in this uh, document? Yes. From the year 2000? Yes. I, to the best of my recollection, we did not include anything about homosexuality. Uh, our, uh, the then not very significant, uh, not very, you know, very nascent uh, gay marriage legal cases. I'm not confident of this, but to the best of my knowledge, this document does not make ex any extensive or perhaps even no references to those topics. Right. That's based on my memory. Okay, now let me ask you to turn to uh, page 8. And there's a heading that says, What is marriage? Um, uh, six dimensions. And it says, Marriage has at least six important dimensions. Do you see that? Yes, sir. And do you agree with that? Marriage has at least six important dimensions? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Um, I, I think I would have to take a moment to review what this group of scholars wrote. Uh, I was a signatory to this document, and so I read it and thought it was a valuable and positive contribution. But if you want me to, I'm not quite sure if you if you want me to, on a word-by-word -word basis, say that I agree with every single sentence in the following few paragraphs, I'm afraid you're going to have to give me a moment to read them and, and refresh my memory of what the actual wording of each one of them is. Um, my, my present question, and if you have to read it, read it, but my present question was whether simply whether you, as a signatory to this document, agreed that marriage has at least six important dimensions. What I will say is that I agree that this is a, a value, for the purposes of this document, for what this document was trying to do, I, agree, I believe that this is a useful way of describing marriage's dimensions. Uh, the first of these six important dimensions is that marriage is a legal contract. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Um, and taking the current subject of, of gay and heterosexual marriage, um, whether you have a heterosexual couple or a gay or lesbian couple, 
the dimension of marriage as a legal contract would be the same, correct? Yes, sir. And the second dimension is you're, you're saying that gay you're saying that same sex marriage would be a legal contract like opposite sex marriage. Yes, yes sir. Okay. Yes, sir. And the second um, uh, important dimension that's listed here is marriage as a financial partnership. Do you that see that? That would be the same as well. That would be the same for heterosexual couples and homosexual couples, correct? Yes, sir. And the next uh, important dimension of marriage that's listed here is marriage is a sacred promise. And that, again, would be the same for gay and lesbian couples as for heterosexual couples, correct? As would be the case in sexual union and personal bond. Which are the next two. Yes, sir. Uh, sex, marriage as a sexual union was the fourth important dimension, and marriage as a personal bond was the fifth important dimension, correct? Yes, sir. And the sixth important dimension is marriage is a family-making bond, correct? Yes, sir. And um, obviously a heterosexual uh, marriage can, um, and, I, and, and by family-making bond, let, let me just ask, does this mean it's a family-making bond even when there are only two people, or does it mean that this is a, uh, a way of establishing uh, children? I just I, I I'm afraid I'm sorry could you repeat the question sure let, let me break it let me break it up this way um, the sixth important dimension is marriage is a family making bond um, now uh, when two people are married they become a family correct yes sir and that is true for gay and lesbian couples on the one hand and um, uh, Opposite. He heterosexual <clears throat> couples on the other. Right? Yes, sir. Um, uh, and both gay and lesbian couples on the one hand and opposite sex couples on the other um, uh, can raise children within that family bond, correct? Can both opposite-sex couples and same-sex couples raise children? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, uh, and um, in that connection, let me let me the ask. Important you, the word. The important word there is the verb raise. Yes. But yes. And um, uh, in that connection. Let me ask you to um, turn to tab nine. Um, this is Plants Exhibit 2898. Um, it is an article in Social Science Quarterly by Laura Langbean and Mark Yost entitled Same-Sex Marriage and Negative Externalities. Do you see that? I am looking at this article for the first time, I believe, yes. Okay, so you've not seen this before? To um, the best of my knowledge, I have not. Uh, do you know either of these authors? No, sir. Um, so you're not familiar with either of these two authors or their work? I can't say that I've never read anything by them, but it, sitting here right now, it, they are not; those names are not familiar to me. Uh, Your Honor, we would ask that you take judicial notice of uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2898. Um, now, uh, on the first page, there is a summary and there are headings, objectives, methods, results, and conclusions. Do you see those headings? Yes, yes sir. Uh, now, after conclusions, um, the article states, as, a, as, as the conclusions, the argument that same-sex marriage poses a negative externality on society cannot be rationally held. 
although many might believe that this conclusion is so obvious that it does not warrant testing, many politicians use this argument as a fact-based rationale to legitimatize bans on same-sex marriage. Now, you have said that you don't recall having seen this article before, but are you aware of scholars who have asserted uh, in peer-reviewed articles that the argument that same-sex marriage poses a negative externality on society cannot be rationally held? Yes, and I'm also aware that of many arguing that it's so obvious that it need not warrant, it need not be tested. So you're aware of... Uh, In other words, it's a self-evident beginning proposition for them. They, they, they think that it's so self-evident that uh, anybody who has an opposing point of view is not a rational person. <clears throat> and um, many, many articles they, say this. Many articles say this. Yes, sir. Um, uh, incidentally, um, um, you, you talked about how the issues that you are addressing are issues that are addressed by sociologists, anthropologists, and psychologists, and other scholars. Um, have you uh, looked at what associations of those scholars have said about same-sex marriage? Y yes, sir. So, a, n a number of them I have looked at. Yes, sir. I don't know that I've necessarily looked at every one, but I've, I've certainly seen a number of them. <clears throat> um, uh, do you know, for example, um, and I'm going to hand out another binder, Thank you. Um, do you know, um, uh, for example, uh, what position the American Psychoanalytic Association takes uh, with respect to same-sex marriage? My recollection is that their uh, corporate kind of uh, lobbying body has endorsed it. Hey, the lobbying body? Or they're, they're the, the leaders of their association, let's put it that way. The, the, the people that speak for them as a, as a, as an, as a, as a professional scholarly association, they're, they're leaders. Um, uh, let me ask you to um, look at tab two, three of this new uh, and did you? Where um, you have a uh, publication of the American Psychoanalytic Association. You see that? I think my tab three says lesbian mothers, gay fathers, and their children, a review. Unless I'm. Uh, we must have a different. Uh, you should have. You should have plaintiffs' exhibit 760 there. Um, Am I in the wrong book? Oh. Different book? Find you just given. Three. Find you just given. Tab three. Here it is. Yes, sir. Um, the American Psychoanalytic Association publication, plaintiffs' exhibit 760. A position paper. Yes. And. Um, it says the um, um, American Psychoanalytic Association in 1977 endorsed the following marriage resolution. Do you see that? Uh, yes, sir. Um, and it states, because marriage is a basic human right and an individual personal choice, resolved the state should not interfere with same-gender couples who choose to marry and share fully and equally in the rights and responsibilities and commitment of civil marriage. Um, uh, were you aware that in 1997 the American Psychoanalytic Association had adopted that resolution? Yes, sir. I believe I have, I, I believe I have read this one or read excerpts from this 
position statement. As I mentioned, there are many such statements, and I, I'm, I might be able to save us time by saying I perfectly understand that many scholarly associations, the leadership groups, as a policy matter, have endorsed same-sex marriage. Now, you say as a policy um, a matter. Um, let me ask you to look at page four of this exhibit. There are a number of references are listed. And um, um, are you aware of these references? Have you read these materials? Well, I've read a number of them. I, okay, let me see if I've read every single one. No, sir, I have not read all of them. Why don't you just identify the ones you've not read? Bradford, Chan, De Placido, Faulkner, Green, I don't know. Greenan, King, Herrick. I've read Gilbert Hurt, but I can't recall if I've read this article or not by Gilbert Hurt and his colleague Kurtzer House. I don't believe I've read Kurtzner. Keycoat Glazer, I think I have read. I'm pretty sure I've actually cited it somewhere, but I can't speak with certainty on that. Kim, no, I don't think. Although I'm not sure, Meyer, I don't think so. Morris, I don't think so. Patterson, I think so. But I, I've certainly read Charlotte Patterson's work on this subject over the years. This, she's written many articles, and I believe I've read this one, but I'm not 100% confident that I have. Peplo, I don't think so. And Williams, I don't think so. I will, I said Williams, I'm confident I have not read. So um, you did read the uh, Waite and Gallagher um, uh, article. and um, It's a book. And you uh, think you read the uh, Patterson article. You're pretty sure you um, read the Keycolt Glazer article. And you read the two articles by Amo, um, um, is it Amato? Amato, Amato, Paul Amato. Amato. The two articles by Amato, and the article or book, I guess it is, by Bloomstein and Schwartz. Is that correct? That's my best. That's the best answer I can give you right now. Okay. Um, uh, let me uh, just while, I, while I'm uh, here. Um, the American Psychological Association um, has also uh, adopted a resolution um, in favor of gay marriage. Correct, sir? Yes, sir. Um, and um, uh, let me ask you to look at uh, tab four in this binder. And this is exhibit uh, 765. Um, have you seen this document before? I believe this is in evidence, is it not? It is, it is, Your Honor. It is, Your Honor. Mr. Boyce, I'm, I'm fairly confident that I read it when it came out, but I can't absolutely give you a... I, it's my best... I certainly know of the endorsement, and I have certainly read of the endorsement, and I know that I've read excerpts, and I believe I read the document in its entirety when it came out, but I cannot say that with absolute certainty. Um, uh, now, on um, the uh, third and fourth and fifth pages of the document, the last three pages of the document, uh, there are a series of references 
You see that? Yes, sir. Um, now, um, this is a this is a very long list, uh, and um, by glancing at it, can you tell me uh, whether you have read most of these or not read most of these? By most, do you mean more than fifty percent? I'm just trying to figure out, is it faster to ask you those that you've read or those that you've not read? Which is the faster way to go through this? Just give me one moment. I think that I have not read at least 51% of these documents. Okay, then why don't you just tell me the ones you have read? The Anthropological Association Statement. Again, I think, well, that's a different Bloomstein and Schwartz. I don't think I've, I don't know whether I've read that or not. Most of these I have not read. Some of them are duplicative of the other, the previous list that we were going through. Question. Eskridge. Whether he has read or not read. 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 Which are the ones has he, has he read? <clears throat> oh, see. Okay. American Anthropological Association, Eskridge, Goodrich, I think Johnson. I think, I think those few are it on this okay. list. Okay. So that would, um, uh, and, and, and you said Estridge. Did you read both of the uh, Estridge um, articles that are here? No, sir. Just the equality practice. That was his uh, book. So, um, it would be I'm sorry that I'm sorry that it was a, a a law review article. So you would have you would have read. I've, I've also read his books, but that's a different. That's what's listed here is uh, a quality practice as a law review article. You would have read four or perhaps five of the forty or forty-one references that are listed here, correct? I think that's fair. Yes, sir. <coughs> Let me ask you to uh, turn to uh, tab 10 in the first binder that I gave you this morning, not the, not the recent little binder. First binder I gave you this morning, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2899. I'm sorry. I'm May I approach your honor? I'm just... Sure. I'm just having a hard time finding out the binder that I'm to look in. One of these? This Tab 10 in that binder. Okay. This is Plaintiff's Exhibit 2899. It's entitled, Will Providing Marriage Rights to Same-Sex Couples Undermine Heterosexual Marriage? You see that? I do, yes, sir. Is this a, is this a document that you've reviewed? Uh, it's not listed on my documents uh, uh, included, but it... Uh, Badgett is someone whose articles 
I have read. I don't know whether or not I have specifically reviewed this article. Your Honor, I would offer Plaintiff's Exhibit 2899. No objection to the court taking judicial notice of Very well. Um, She's a prominent uh, proponent of same-sex marriage is Badgett. So I've read, I know I've read a number of her things. She is a well-regarded scholar, is she not? I don't know, uh, I don't know, know her. I'm perfectly happy to take your word for that. I'm sure she is. But, but you, you don't know that one way or the other. I'm just saying that I've read several of her articles in an attempt to acquaint myself with her work and I appreciate the integrity of those articles. I, I don't know quite what else to say. She's obviously taking a very position quite opposite to my own on almost every possible question, but I respect her as a thinker. Um, Have your answer. Let me ask you to look at uh, tab 11 in the same binder. Yes, sir. Um, this is uh, uh, Dependence Exhibit 2. And I don't know whether this is in evidence or not. I think it's I think it's on my uh, list, Mr. Boyce. The Amato article. Yes. Yeah. Um, Whatever extent it is not, we have no objection to it. Right. Um, a request to move it in. It is, Your Honor. All right. <coughs> um, and um, uh, this is a. Uh, an article in which uh, Amato investigates um, how children in households with both biological parents differ from children in households with only one biological parent, correct? Well, uh, I see that you've read that from a summary that was written by someone else. Uh, <coughs> Let me ask you what I'm, your what I would, uh, my understanding is that he's writing an article on the impact of family formation change on the cognitive, social, and emotional well-being of the next generation. That, that's the title of the thing. The yes, sir. Um, but uh, in terms of, you've read this whole thing, of course. Yes, sir. Um, and uh, do you have a current recollection of it enough to answer a question about what the... Uh, overall uh, methodology of this article was? Well, I believe he looked at uh, 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 some data from the Ad Health uh, survey, and I believe he was trying to investigate whether or not children who grow up uh, in, uh, I, believe he, I believe he at several times in the article refers to it as continuously married biological parents. I believe he is trying to compare uh, using this uh, body of data uh, in this particular article. In other books and articles he's looked at different bodies of data, but in this particular article it's Ad Health and he's trying to estimate outcome differences uh, uh, comparing children who are growing up in continuously married uh, to biological parent homes with children from uh, other uh, uh, family structures, and he's making certain conclusions about those inquiries, and then he's making uh, a policy recommendation at the end that it would be much to no, the no, advantage. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not asking you to summarize or give a book report on this. Um, uh, I I'm just want to have two quick questions that I ought to be able to get answers to. The first is that is it your understanding that what he compares are the outcome differences between children in households with both biological parents as compared to children in households with only one biological parent. Is that your understanding or well, not? Well, not really. Okay, let me ask you to look at the second paragraph of the uh, document, okay? It says, Amato begins by investigating how children in households with both biological parents differ from children in households with only one biological parent. Do you see that? Can you tell me where you're reading from? 
very second paragraph of the document. Amato begins by investigating how children in households with both biological parents differ from children in households with only one biological parent. Do you I, see that? I was reading from the... You see that? Yes, sir, I see Okay. Um, now, is it your understanding that when Amato uses the term biological parent in this article, he is including adoptive parents to be the same as biological parents? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, now, um, with respect to um, uh, the, the issue of biology, um, I, you believe that it is more important that children uh, grow up with two parents than that they grow up with a single biological parent, correct? That That's not familiar to me as a statement that I've made. Well, for example, um, have you stated that it is important to encourage unmarried women who have children to give their babies up for adoption by married couples? In several publications with certain qualifications in place, I have, with specifically with reference in my mind to t unmarried teenage girls, I have made such a recommendation to the best of my memory, I have made such a recommendation. Or I may have been a part of a study that <coughs> made such a recommendation. All right. Um, may I have just a moment, Your Honor? Very well. Um, uh, Your Honor, we've agreed on a, a list of documents uh, to be admitted, uh, and I would hand that uh, up if I can. Very well. There's one document not on this list. It's a, uh, a declaration by uh, Mr. Prentice, but it, it will be added to the list. It was part of an arrangement. Fair enough. Uh, what's the, do you have an exhibit number on the document to be added? Well, all right. Number it later. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, um, all right, Mr. Uh, uh, I can horn. Let me... Um, Let me just uh, ask you, to, hopefully, just two more uh, quick areas. Um, um, first, um, would you turn to tab three of this binder, the binder that has 15 tabs to it? I have it, yes, sir. Um, and uh, this is um, the review article that you referred to other previously in published in Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics, is that correct? I, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, I must be, I, my three. mind says... Tab three. 
sorry. Uh, lesbian mothers, gay fathers, and their children? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, uh, are you familiar with this document? Um, I, I don't believe so, sir. Okay. Um, uh, now, there's something that's head of the abstract, and you know what an abstract is, do you not? Of course. Um, and um, the abstract says there is a variety of families headed by a lesbian or gay male parent or same-sex couple. Findings from research suggest that children with lesbian or gay parents are comparable with children with heterosexual parents on key psychosocial developmental outcomes. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Um, and uh, even though you may not be aware of this article, are you aware of other articles um, in peer-reviewed journals that reach that conclusion? Yes, sir, I am aware. Uh, uh, now, uh, we've talked a lot about the institution of marriage. Um, uh, you would agree that the institution of marriage is constantly evolving, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, always changing, correct? I wrote those words in my book. And no single universally accepted definition of marriage, correct? I wrote those words, too. Um, Your Honor, I have no more questions. Redirect, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Your Honor. I can be quite brief, I think. Um, <coughs> Mr. Blankenhorn, is, is, your, is your book in front of you, the entire book, Future Parents? You mean, oh, no, the, sir. No, but sir. But I hand the, the full book because there's a page I wanted to refer to that isn't in any of these excerpts that are before him. This is Exhibit 9, DIX 956, and I believe this has already been admitted. <coughs> May I hand the book to the witness? Yes, indeed. I say 956 is in. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Mr. Blankenhorn, do you recall yesterday when Mr. Boyes read a passage from page two of your book, The Future of Marriage, in which you st say, among other things, that I believe that today the principle of equal human dignity must apply to gay and lesbian persons. Do you recall that? Yes. Look on page three of your book, uh, last two paragraphs. Uh, I I'd like to read those paragraphs. Uh, into the record. Many thinkers, perhaps most notably Isaiah Berlin, the great 20th century philosopher of liberalism, have pointed out that many important choices we face do not involve choosing between good and bad, but between good and good. It is good to deter crime by punishing criminals. It is also good to forgive, but doing more punishing means doing less forgiving, because the two goods are, to some extent, mutually exclusive. Berlin's concept of goods in conflict is central to my understanding of society's need to make choices regarding the definition of marriage. One good is the equal dignity of all persons. Another good is a mother and father as a child's birthright. These goods are at least partially in conflict. Resolving that conflict, making a morally responsible choice about the future of marriage that is faithful to the essential purposes of the institution while at least recognizing both of these goods, is a major aim of this book. Earlier, I think, in your colloquy with Mr. Boyce, you mentioned uh, a conflict of goods. 
uh, is this does this essentially capture your your uh, thought on that or summarize it? Yes, sir. Turn to page twenty of the witness. Uh, excuse me. The. Uh, uh, of the document behind tab 13 of your witness binder from this morning and that is another excerpt that is an excerpt of your book from Fatherless America? yeah, no, this, this is from uh, of America. oh yes I have it, Thank. I'm sorry okay. Call this morning a colloquy with Mr. Boys in which you made clear that uh, to the degree you must choose uh, between the rights and interests of gays uh, and uh, with respect to same sex marriage on the one hand and the interests that you have articulated previously that are served by customary marriage, you would with anguish choose those interests served by customary uh, marriage, do you recall that? Yes, sir. Right, I want you to refer now to page 20, the last full paragraph of your, uh, of, of the page uh, uh, in, in your book, The Future of Marriage, and, uh, and I'd like to read that as well. In the case of same-sex marriage, one priority is the particular rights and needs of same-sex couples the right to equal respect, the right to form loving, stable partnerships and families, and the need for greater social acceptance. Another priority is the collective rights and needs of children, the right to know and be loved by a mother and a father, and the need for as many children as possible to grow up under a strong shelter of marriage, our society's most pro-child institution. To the degree that these two priorities can be in harmony, or at least exist together in peace, I want to embrace them both. Is that your view? Yes, sir. Can be embraced in harmony. Yes, sir. That, for example, many of the items that you identified <coughs> this morning on the list of good uh, public policy outcomes that would flow from same-sex marriage can be achieved uh, through, for example, domestic partnerships? I do. That's my understanding of the, uh, of the, I, that's been my own uh, conclusion in trying to wrestle with this concept of goods in conflict, and that's, that this is the conclusion that I have come to as I have tried to to, to reconcile these, this conflict as best I can. And, and did you speak to that yesterday in connection with describing the process you had gone through, uh, which culminated, I think, in the publication of, a, of an article in the New York Times uh, early last year? Yes, sir, in, uh, endorsing the, uh, the protection of marriage for its uh, distinctive purpose, but also establishing very strong uh, domestic partnership uh, structures. Your Honor, I have no further questions. I would like to submit uh, into the record for judicial review a copy of that New York Times article. I don't have it <laughs> in my hands right now, but, if, but I will get copies uh, into my hands and into the courts and into counsel. No very well. That'll be <coughs> marked as uh, DIX next in order. Here they are now. So you have able, able assistance. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And so I have no further questions, John. Very well. Then thank you, Mr. Uh, Blankenhorn. You may step down. Thank you for your testimony. <coughs> <coughs> Any additional witnesses, Mr. Cooper? Call your next witness. Oh, 
Your Honor, we have no further witnesses. Very well. Now, I understood that you had some uh, uh, documents that you wanted to add. Have we taken care of that this morning? Your Honor, this will just take a very brief moment, um, but there are a couple of uh, items. We, we have um, a proffer of documents, and uh, the plaintiffs uh, have not objected uh, to uh, this list of documents. These are the official campaign speech uh, and materials of protectmarriage.com, and we have a list uh, of those documents. Uh, in addition, there is one other document, DIX 2717, uh, which the plaintiffs have not objected to. So with the court's permission, we would submit that list. DIX? Uh, 2717. Oh. Uh, in addition, Your Honor, a moment ago, uh, there was reference to the fact that we had an additional document for which we didn't have a number. We now have the document. We have a number. It's under seal, but uh, uh, may I uh, pass that to the clerk? Okay. And it's DIX 2719. And that's being admitted uh, without objection, I gather. Um, in addition, Your Honor, uh, just in, in the nature of uh, housekeeping, um, we have uh, countered the counter designations of Professor Young and Nathanson, the pink and the yellow. Yep. Well, we, we understand the court will resolve that at the court's convenience, but we just wanted to note that we, we still would like the pink and the yellow in the record. <laughs> uh, and uh, in addition, we have made some counter designations of Dr. Tam's deposition. Uh, we understand that there may be objections to that, but we'd still like to um, submit those subject to whatever objections the plaintiffs have. Your Honor, we just received those this morning, so we would like, if, if possible, the opportunity to review them and make a submission by the end of the week to, with our position or counter designations. That would be fine. And, and the same goes for Dr. Robinson, and we have no objection to their taking till the end of the week on, on that for their Dr. Robinson. There is some counters for him. Right. Now, I, I too have some housekeeping that I wanted want to do, but perhaps. Um, I, I have one more item, Your Honor. All right, and I'll, then I'll be done. Um, and then finally, Your Honor. Um, <coughs> It, we, we did note, as the court is aware, that our motions to compel are outstanding, and we're not in a position to formally rest our case until those are resolved. If we were to receive documents from the No on 8 campaigns, then we might want to leave to submit those documents and or call witnesses pertaining to those subject matters. But other than that, we have no further witnesses and no further documents. Very well. well we have either this morning or last evening uh, issued an order calling for a response from the third parties that you have uh, subpoenaed, uh, the three organizations, and have also given the plaintiffs an opportunity to chime in if they wish to do so. They may or may not wish to do so, but <clears throat> we've set a briefing schedule on that, and so uh, we should receive those by, by Friday. Thank you, Your Honor. So I think that will be taken care of. Um, and housekeeping from the plaintiffs. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, and, and they are truly housekeeping. The, the first issue, um, the Plaintiffs Exhibit 2332A, which was the list of materials considered by Mr. Blankenhorn, was not moved into evidence. We thought we would like to move that into evidence, so it's in the record before the court. 2332A? That's correct. And then, um, hearing no objection. No objection. Very well. Thank you, Your Honor. Another exhibit issue um, during Mr. Boyes' examination of Mr. Blankenhorn, he referred to Plaintiff's Exhibit 744, which was the book, The Future of Marriage, by Mr. Blankenhorn. Yes. Um, Defendant's Exhibit 956 is the book, it's in evidence. We could either move ours in too, or just I could clarify for the record that when Mr. Boyes was referring to Plaintiff's Exhibit 744, he was referring to the book, which, which is uh, Defendant's Exhibit 956, which is in evidence. Very well. We'll simply note in the record that those two uh, 
um, books are the same book by different exhibit numbers. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as the court will recall, we had moved into evidence a couple of two documents from the <coughs> Library of Congress, and we did not have the official copies. We represented the court that they were in the Library of Congress. We now have official copies, so I would simply like to substitute in the official copies, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2581, which was the IRS letter from 1974, and then Plaintiff's Exhibit 2566, which was the, um, ma the letter to the Mattachine Society. And I will provide copies to the court and to opposing counsel. Very well. And then finally, we, we have um, a, a number of documents that we just received uh, from the where we disputed issues in the privilege log, and, and we would like to reserve the right to review those and supplement the record if appropriate and as appropriate once we've had a chance to review them. Very well. That Thank you. Be fine. Thank you, Your Honor. I think that's, that's it from my list. I was going to ask the plaintiffs, and now that the defendants have essentially rested, whether you intend to call any rebuttal witnesses. We do not, Your Honor. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I, I do apologize. I forgot to one last housekeeping. Uh, Fatherless America has been admitted twice under the wrong number. Uh, it, it's, uh, I, we labeled it DIX 103, but it's actually 108. So we just wanted the record to be clear that Fatherless America is 108, and the record should be corrected to reflect that. Thank you. Right. Uh, anything further from any party? How about the Attorney General? or any of the other defendants. All right. We have um, some uh, loose ends <coughs> for the court to take care of, <coughs> one of which has been mentioned, and that is the motion to compel compliance with the no on eight subpoenas <coughs> that the defendants are seeking. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and <coughs> that should be taken care of uh, shortly. <clears throat> we have uh, as yet unresolved the motion to withdraw by uh, Dr. Tam, and I think that's fully briefed, and so it simply remains to be ruled upon by the court. Similarly, I believe the motion to intervene by Imperial County has been fully briefed, and that remains to be ruled on by the court. Uh, we have 137 documents that the plaintiffs lodged with the court that have not been submitted on the record. You recall those, Mr. Boutros? I believe those came from the production. Um, Why don't you? Well, we have the documents. <laughs> <laughs> Things do run downhill, don't they? This is the. issues through the, the exhibits we've put into evidence so they can now remain with us unless the court would like them back. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have enough, Mr. <laughs> All right, that's helpful. Uh, amicus briefs. Um, do the parties have a position on amicus briefs? My inclination, I have some inclination with reference to that, but I'd be Happy to hear any suggestions that the parties wish to offer. Um. There are the, the court feels it would be useful, um, sh you know, relatively brief amicus brief filed, I think the, we had, the court had indicated seven days after the close of evidence at one of our earlier hearings. 
we would we would welcome that as long as the court felt it was useful to the court. But your, Mr. Cooper. Your Honor, we we don't have uh, any kind of uh, uh, you know strident opposition to that, but it's difficult for me to imagine that the court needs additional uh, material to uh, to chew on as you consider the issues before you. But uh, uh, I, I do think that it would be important to have some meaningful opportunity <clears throat> after any amicus briefs were filed for the parties then to put in their own. Uh, their own papers, obviously, to the court. No, obviously, that uh, I quite agree. Um, if it's agreeable to the parties, let me say that the court will set a deadline of seven days from today. That will be um, next Wednesday, which I believe is February 3rd for applications to file amicus briefs and <clears throat> the court will consider any such applications and either grant or deny those as may be appropriate and I will set a 15 page uh, limitation on any amicus uh, participation and <clears throat> provide <clears throat> a period of time for the parties uh, to file whatever response, if any, that they wish to make. Um, I agree with Mr. Cooper that it's it's a uh, abundant record, and uh, I doubt that amicus briefs can add too much, but one, one never knows. So I think <clears throat> we should at least leave the door uh, open to uh, amicus participation. And I believe that's it from my end. Uh, I assume there's nothing further from any of the parties. One other matter, Mr. Boutros. In terms of Ah, yes. Um, here's what I'd like. Uh, I'd like to take some time to go over all of this material. Um, I don't think at this juncture it would be helpful to have post-trial briefs. You may very well, however, wish to submit uh, references to the evidence that have been submitted with your proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law, those you've already submitted. And I'm sure that you presented the evidence in the case uh, with those proposed findings in mind and the conclusions. And so it would be helpful <clears throat> if you could um, furnish those to the court. Uh, I realize that you too have a lot of material to go through. So I'll be guided by your suggestion about uh, how much time you need in order to do that. And what I would like to do after receiving those, and after concluding today's proceedings, is to uh, consider that material and then set a date for uh, closing argument. And what I will probably do in connection with setting that date is to perhaps key up some questions that uh, have come to the fore as a result of the uh, review of the evidence and give you an opportunity to address that in closing argument and in any post-trial briefing that you wish to make uh, on the law. But I'd rather leave that date open at the present time. Uh, what, when the time comes, I'll have the clerk uh, call both sides and give you a range of dates so that uh, you can work it out, uh, consistent with, I'm sure, your many other obligations. But uh, I would, at this point, I think only request uh, references to the evidence that you've submitted in connection with your proposed findings and conclusions. How long do you think it will, how long a time deadline would be reasonable for uh, that submission? 30 days would be fine with us, Your Honor, and I think that that sounds like a, an excellent approach. Sir uh, Cooper? Uh, it seems to me that 30 days should be uh, should uh, be adequate, Your Honor, yes. Well, that will be then uh, 
Well, why don't we set uh, February 26? That's that's just about 30 days. So, uh, <clears throat> all right, February 26, uh, and probably by that time, I'll have a much better idea of uh, what kind of schedule we should uh, set for the closing argument. All right, anything further? On, on behalf of plaintiffs, we just wanted to thank the court staff for making it so easy to try the case, and, and we very much appreciate everything everyone did during the, the trial. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, I want to extend my congratulations to uh, the lawyers in the case for obviously a fascinating case, extremely well presented on both sides. Uh, obviously, there are some old hands in the courtroom in uh, this proceeding, but I've been particularly struck by the very fine work of many of the younger lawyers in the case, both uh, here in the courtroom and I'm sure behind the scenes. Uh, it really, uh, the old hand should take great pride and pleasure in uh, the younger colleagues that you've worked with. Uh, they've done a splendid job and so uh, you have much to be pleased about. And I would just like to take a moment to personally congratulate you and tell you what a good job you've all done.